decision making, nothing really gets to the core of what a manager does more than either making a decision or in the process of making it delegating part or all the decision to people that you work with or that work for you. All important components to a manager's job. The optimal decision making uh, model is one that assumes full rationality. And rationality is used and defined in various ways depending on what context, what discipline and what context you talk about it. But here, uh, full rationality really means that you have access to all the information, all information, and a preference for different outcomes. How much you prefer this happen or how much it's worth if A occurs and how much you prefer or it's worth if B occurs. That's seldom the case, but some decisions become very structured and the optimizing decision-making model is uh, preferred because the consequence for making a bad decision is so high that we take the time to go through the process. So in your book, it says the decision-making process there, it's really referring to the optimal decision-making process where it has these steps, identify and define the problem, generate and evaluate alternative courses of action, decide on a preferred course of action. The optimizing decision-making model is, involves identifying first what the problem is. That seems easy and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more probably in the next video. The second step, once you identify what the real problem is, and that's accurate, because if you have identified the problem incorrectly, obviously you pursue the wrong course of action. No matter how good you are in the process, you're addressing the wrong problem. Identify the, the problem and then you list all the criteria that are important to you. So if you're trying to pick a university or something, if that's a decision that you're trying to make, then you need to list all of the criteria that are important to you. What's the nightlife like? What kind of majors exist? And if you go through and list all of them, assuming you're pur purely rational, this is a very, very big list. You're gonna need a spreadsheet and a lot of time to list all those things. Second, you need to be able to evaluate how important each of these criteria are so you can do this any way you want, but you should be able to do it numerically. Whether you have a scale from one to 10 or one to a million doesn't make any difference as long as you use that scale consistently. So let's say you have one through 10, you need to know with some level of certainty how much, how important each criteria is. So the criteria of nightlife is not equally as important to each person who attends UCF or any other college, maybe for a younger person coming right out of their home life a nightlife is hugely important, but some of you are coming back to school and you work full time and you don't go out much, so a nightlife almost makes no difference whatsoever to you. What would be more important to some people is what major. Some people are set on being a business student or studying biochemistry or laser optics, and if a school doesn't have that, they're not going to be interested in that school. So you have to understand what's important to you. Those are your criteria. Once you know what's important to you, you need to look at all of the alternatives. This again is a large list because you've already expressed in your criteria things like where the school would be located, how far from home. You've already weighted those things accurately because you're able to be rational. It's a big assumption. Then you list all schools. So in theory, this would mean listing all schools. Well, there are a lot of schools in the United States, but nothing says that you need to limit it to the United States. Why would you do that? You'd be excluding millions of, well, not millions, but <laughs> hundreds of thousands of universities throughout the whole world. In order to be completely rational, you need to consider all those. And if they're not suitable for you, your criteria will wash them out essentially. So again, the extent to which this is a big and important decision that you can't undo you go through the time to list all the criteria and then all the different alternatives and you would evaluate each alternative based on each of the criteria you listed and again you'd apply a weight to that again it doesn't matter if you use a scale 1 to 10 or 1 to 100 or 1 to a bazillion you simply want to use the same scale for all the alternatives so if you were looking at the decision to go to college you'd say I could go to the University of Florida and for the University of Florida, you need a weight from one to 10, let's say, on how well in your assessment, the University of Florida satisfies the criteria of nightlife or what majors they offer and so on and so forth. 
So now you have an, a group of two weights. You have weights associated with all the criteria of all the things that are at all important to you, and you have weights for every alternative in the extent to which each of the criteria is satisfied by that alternative. And then for each of the alternatives, each school in this little example that you're considering going to, that you have on your list as a potential, you take the weight that that university or college satisfies the criteria times the importance of that, and you get a weighted average. You take nightlife, University of Florida gets a 2 out of 10 because it's a yucky place to be. We want to be here in Orlando where the parties really happen. And then you say, party, how important is it? Well, for a lot of you, it's about a 7 out of 10, 0.2, two times 7, that gets 14. So you write down 14 next to University of Florida. And then you go to the next criteria. How well does university satisfy the number of options for majors or the majors you're interested in? And then how important that is. You multiply those, cross multiply, and you get the weighted average here, one score, by summing those up for the University of Florida. You do that for every alternative, so every alternative now has a weighted average score. And then what does a rational person do? A rational person picks the university with the highest score, but that assumes that you know what those weights are and they are accurate, and you know the extent to which each alternative, each school in this case, satisfies each criteria, and then the math tells you which one to pick. Now, is that the way we really make decisions? No, probably not. Even very big, complex decisions, people have decision biases, and we don't consider all the alternatives because of the resources required to do so. Nonetheless, the lesson here is that when a decision is really important, we should be thoughtful and logical about it. It's funny how in the most important decisions we make in our life, we don't follow these kinds of basic methodologies. Think about the decision of who you'll date or who, who you'll marry. Dating is no big deal, but who you'll marry. There's going to be a lifelong contract between you and that person. And what do you base that on? Are you, are you listing the criteria? Are you really considering what your alternatives are? Do you even know how do you make such an important commitment, important decision, relatively undoable without quite a few consequences in your life, yet we look for alternative ways to make the decision. We should be careful at least. We should consider this more optimal way of making decisions even though we can't satisfy it fully. It helps us from making catastrophic decisions that we can't afford in our lives. And at work, of course, this applies so wholeheartedly. When we're making big decisions about organizational resources, it's our fiduciary responsibility to the owners and stockholders to take the time to go through the process as best we can and get other people involved in the decision making. So in the next little video I'm going to talk specifically about how to identify the problem and what happens when we don't identify the problem correctly.